on September 2nd, 2016, Lauren, just 13 years old, was returning from school in the company of her friend, a girl named Michaela. They took the same route back every day, but that day something terrible happened. Lauren and Michaela were victims of an insane and senseless crime in a case that shocked the city of Wichita Falls, Texas. Hey everyone, how are you all doing? Welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, I'm gonna talk about a case that happened in Texas in 2016. So without further ado, let's get to the video. Lauren Teresia Landavaso was born on October 14, 2002 in Wichita Falls, a city with just over 100,000 inhabitants located in the state of Texas. She was the daughter of the couple Vernon Wayne Landavazo and Bianca Teresia Landavazo, who, in addition to her, had two more children named Jordan and Tim. Lauren was described by friends and family as a happy, friendly girl who loved the company of other people. Since she was little, she was passionate about animals, especially cats, and as she grew up, she helped with some rescue campaigns. Lauren had a bright future ahead of her, but unfortunately, that future was cut short in the worst way possible. It was a Friday afternoon on September 2nd, 2016. Lauren, along with a friend named Michaela Smith, walked home from McNeil Middle School as they did every day. Both were 13 years old and had no idea that a crazy sadist was watching. At one point during the journey back to the house, the girls passed through an alley, and at that time, a vehicle that they had never seen before closed in on them and stopped right in front of them. In a few seconds, the driver's door opened and a young man got out of the vehicle. This young man stood in front of the girls, staring at them without even blinking. Lauren and Michaela thought it was a joke on the boy's part. They then ignored him and continued on their way. Shortly after that, the young man took a rifle from inside his vehicle and started shooting at the girls who had their backs to him. In total, approximately 16 shots were fired. 15 of them hit Lauren. The first shot fired hit Makilla right in the chest, and even though she was badly injured, she managed to run and find shelter. Soon after firing all his ammunition, the boy fled the scene. As I said, it was late on a Friday, and there were many people on the street including other students from the same school as Lauren and Michaela, who, like them, were also returning to their homes. All these people were very confused and scared by the whole horrible situation. It didn't take long for the news of this sad event to spread throughout the city of Wichita Falls and leave local residents very afraid. In the midst of all this confusion, an acquaintance of Bianca, Lauren's mother, called her and told her that some students had been shot while walking home from school. As Lauren had not yet returned home, Bianca became desperate and decided to go to the place where the victims were shot. Upon arriving, Bianca saw numerous police vehicles and ambulances, as well as several people who were at the scene trying to understand what had happened. From the scene, Bianca realized the gravity of the entire situation. The woman decided to get closer to the crime scene. She wanted to see who the people that had been shot were, it was then that she saw the paramedics struggling to try to save Lauren, who was lying there on the ground, severely injured. Upon realizing that one of the victims was her daughter, Bianca, desperate, began to cry and scream. She did not want to believe what her eyes were seeing. After the paramedics did everything they could, Lauren was taken to the hospital. Vernon, Lauren's father, was at work when everything happened, and as soon as he found out about it, he left work and went to the hospital where his daughter was. At the hospital, Doctors did their best to try to save Lauren, but due to her serious injuries, she couldn't resist and passed away. The news not only shook the girl's family and friends, but also shook all of Wichita Falls. Before long, the news had spread, and what everyone wanted to know was who was responsible for the crime. The medical examiner who examined Lauren's body found that she had suffered 15 gunshot wounds from a 22 caliber rifle. Two of these injuries were to the head region, and according to the coroner, any one of them would have been fatal. In other words, if Lauren had been hit by just one of those shots to the head, she would have died the same way. As a result, the coroner concluded that what most contributed to the girl's death were the gunshots to the head. Perhaps if she hadn't been hit in this vital region, she would probably be alive. Michaela Smith. Lauren's friend who was walking home with her from school and who was also shot, 
was rushed to the hospital. Despite being hospitalized in a serious condition, Michaela saw a significant improvement in her health in the following days. Once she got better, she was able to speak to detectives and gave a description of the person who shot her and Lauren. Detectives had already seen images recorded by security cameras in the area where the crime occurred, but in the images it was not possible to see the shooter precisely, only the car he used, which was a gold-colored SUV. According to Michaela, the shooter was young, white, and had brown hair that fell around his face. She also said that he was very thin, had a somewhat large nose, and had acne spread across almost his entire face. Through the description provided by Michaela Smith, police were able to create a rough sketch of what the shooter looked like. This draft was widely disseminated to the public through authorities and local media. Nearly two days later, police received a call from a woman who said she had seen her neighbor, a man matching the shooter's description, carrying what appeared to be a case of rifle ammunition to his apartment on the day of the shooting. This person is Cody Lott, who was 20 years old at the time of the events. As Cody matched the description given by Michaela, and his apartment was just a few meters from the crime scene, detectives decided to investigate him. Coincidentally, on the same day that Cody came under investigation, a couple called the police reporting that they had seen a man inside a gold SUV that was parked near the makeshift memorial made for Lauren at the place where she was shot. The police officers who were notified about this quickly went to the location with the intention of intercepting the suspect. As officers approached the area in question, they spotted the gold SUV heading in the opposite direction. They then signaled the driver to pull over the vehicle. The driver pulled over. The police went to the SUV and asked the driver for permission to search the car. Behind the wheel was Cody Lott, who didn't show any hint of nervousness. That's because Cody was confident. He had cleaned the entire vehicle thoroughly, and the cops weren't going to find anything incriminating in his car. In fact, nothing linking Cody to the crime was found in his vehicle. However, the officers found something else, a pair of brass knuckles. Since this was illegal in the state of Texas at the time, officers booked Cody for criminal possession of a weapon and took him to the police department. In the state of Texas, criminal gun possession can lead to a hefty fine and possible prison time. At the police department, Cody was placed in custody and then taken to an interrogation room where he was questioned about the crime that killed Lauren and left Michaela in serious condition. At first, Cody said he didn't know anything and hadn't even heard about two girls being shot. However, after an hour or so, Cody started saying some things, things that left the police officers in the room stunned. Cody told officers he was in love with Lauren. According to him, this passion had started when, from the window of his apartment where he lived with his mother and stepfather, he saw Lauren passing by on her way back from school. He was impressed by the girl's beauty, especially her eyes, which according to him, were beautiful. After seeing Lauren for the first time and falling in love with her, Cole said he waited at his apartment window every day just to watch her from afar. The route that Lauren had to take to get back home from her school could definitely be seen by Cole through the window of his apartment. As time went by, Cody in his sick mind began to believe that Lorene belonged to him. He had never even exchanged a single word with the girl, but in his mind, she was born to be his. All the insane passion that Corey had for Lauren turned into hatred in just a few months. This happened after Corey saw the girl holding hands with a boy her age who attended the same school as her. To Corey, that was an unforgivable betrayal, and Lauren would pay dearly for it. Determined to get revenge, Corey spent days planning how he would do it. On the day of the crime, he took one of his stepfather's rifles from the gun cabinet and waited for Lauren to appear. When Lauren appeared returning from school with Michaela, Corey left the apartment, got into the SUV, and headed towards the girls. He stopped right in front of them, blocking their path. Then he got out of the vehicle and stood there staring at them. The girls thought it was some kind of joke. They then ignored him and continued on their way home. At that moment, Cody grabbed the rifle from inside the vehicle and started shooting at the girls who had their backs to him. The first shot hit Michaela right in the chest area. The girl fell to the ground, but then she managed to get up and ran to a safe place. 
All the other shots hit Lorne, who, according to Corey himself, was the main target. Cody even regretted the fact that he ran out of ammunition. He stated that if it weren't for that, he would have ended up with Michaela, too. Corey told the police that despite the whole situation seeming very sad, the truth was that everyone should be happy. According to him, he was a hero because by taking Lauren's life, he prevented her from becoming a victim of bad people in the future. In his mind, he saved Lauren from the dangers that were to come. After shooting the girls, Cody told police officers that he fled the scene when he realized that a confused crowd was forming to try to understand what had happened there. He drove the SUV to a field where he hid the rifle and then drove away to his apartment. Later that night, when he felt he was safe, he returned to the field, picked up the rifle, and put it back in his stepfather's gun cabinet. Even though he discharged a rifle in broad daylight at two girls on a public street, in his head, Cody believed he would never be caught. He told the detectives that they would never catch him because he had no connection with the victims and therefore the police would not be able to reach him. Even during Cody's confession, detectives questioned him about why he took the life of someone who didn't even know he existed. Cody just said that Lauren was destined to be his girlfriend, but after he saw her holding hands with another boy, he decided that if she wasn't going to be with him, he wouldn't be with anyone else. If all these absurdities that Cody said to the detectives weren't enough, he went even further. He told the police that they had an accomplice and that this accomplice was crucial for him to be able to commit the crime. But this accomplice wasn't just anyone, it wasn't even a person. According to Cody, his accomplice was the devil himself. According to Cody, he and the devil talked a lot in the days leading up to the crime. And Cody was instructed to take Lauren's life because she didn't value him. Cody also said that the devil would help him get away and he wouldn't be caught by the authorities. After hearing Cody Lott's entire confession, authorities arrested him and charged him with the crime against Lauren. Despite having told practically everything about how he committed the crime, Cody pleaded not guilty to all charges against him. Even so, the police had more than enough to keep him in custody. And with that, he was held on a $4 million bond while awaiting his trial. In a search of the apartment where Cody lived with his mother and stepfather, police officers found several compromising images on his electronic devices, such as computers and cell phones. Most of these images were of underage women performing adult content. As a result, possession of explicit content was added to Cody's list of crimes. While he was in prison awaiting his trial, Cody was evaluated by some psychiatrists. He even told one of them that he harbored hatred in his heart for feminine nature. Like most young people who commit crimes similar to this, Cody was also described as a loner, but unlike the others, Cody interacted socially with other people and even had some girlfriends. However, psychiatrists defined him as an emotionally immature and very demanding person. This caused him to push away all his girlfriends one by one. As time went by, he became increasingly lonely and began to envy the people around him who were in healthy relationships. According to psychiatrists, at that time, Cody isolated himself from the world, and upon seeing Lauren for the first time, he began to fantasize about romance with her. In the boy's mind, Lauren was perfect in every way and was devoted to him, and only to him. Seeing her with someone else ruined everything, and for that, she had to pay. The detectives even spoke to one of Cody's ex-girlfriends to gather more information about him. According to this ex-girlfriend, Cody had a difficult personality and on some occasions had tantrums for whatever reason. In one of these attacks, the ex-girlfriend told detectives that Cody tried to suffocate her with a seatbelt. After that, she became scared and decided to break up with Cody. Cody didn't want to accept the end of the relationship, and in retaliation, he kidnapped his ex-girlfriend and also her son. He kept the two under his power for a few hours. He threatened them and also attacked them. After that, Cody no longer went after his ex-girlfriend and she, knowing what he was capable of, decided not to report it to the police. She said that when she found out he had been arrested, she felt relieved because now he won't be able to hurt anyone else. 
Detectives also spoke to some of Cody's classmates who went to high school with him. According to most of them, Cody was spoiled and believed that the world and everyone in it should bend to his will. He was also described as a bad-tempered person who demanded a lot from those around him. In addition to all this, authorities also discovered that Cody regularly used drugs, something that only those closest to him knew. To those who saw Corey Lott from a distance, he appeared to be a seemingly normal person. The psychiatrist said he had no difficulties with social interaction, but he only approached people when he wanted something in return. His behavior generally tended to fluctuate. Sometimes he was calm, and other times he would explode and become very irritated. During the period he was in prison, Cody followed the news about his crime on TV. Most media outlets reported that the crime was a random act of violence in which a lone gunman chose to attack two victims he did not know, for no apparent reason. When he saw this news, Cody became frustrated and angry. The crime required weeks of planning, and although he officially declared himself innocent, he wanted everyone to know how he put it together and almost got away with it. Cody wanted attention. He wanted everyone to look at him and see him as smart and dangerous. Cody Lott's trial was set for March 2018. However, his defense argued that he had mental problems and was incapable of being tried as a normal person. The court accepted this argument, and for six months, Cody underwent intensive treatment in a psychiatric center. He was considered mentally sane and competent to be tried as a normal person. During Cody Lott's trial, the prosecution argued that he was a cold and calculating criminal who stalked Lauren, a 13-year-old teenager, for almost a year before taking her life. The prosecution highlighted that Michaela survived the attack that day because the defendant ran out of ammunition. If it weren't for that, Michaela would have suffered the same fate as Lauren. The defense argued that Cody suffered from several mental illnesses that made him unable to distinguish what was right and wrong. They stated that even though he was responsible for the crime, he acted on impulses beyond his control. The defense also said that Cody Lott was not a cold and calculating criminal, but rather a victim of the bad thoughts that dominated him. After hearing arguments from the prosecution and defense, the jury deliberated for about 40 minutes before returning the verdict. In the end, on September 19, 2018, Cody Lott was found guilty on all charges. He was sentenced to life imprisonment plus 20 years in prison. Under current Texas laws, Cody will be eligible for parole in 2048. If he serves his entire sentence as scheduled, he will be over 50 years old when he makes his first attempt at parole. During the trial and after his sentencing, Corey kept the same arrogant face without a hint of remorse. At no point did he apologize, much less express any regret for what he did. He is currently incarcerated in a prison in Texas where he will spend many years. A statue of a black horse was placed at McNeil Middle School in honor of Lauren and Michaela. The statue, in addition to displaying positive messages such as love and live, also features purple and blue footprints, the two best friends' favorite colors. Michaela is doing well today, despite having to carry a physical reminder of that terrible day with her wherever she goes. The projectile fired by Cody, which hit her squarely in the chest, is still lodged in the same place. Doctors said removing it would be too risky, so they chose to leave it where it is. They hope that over time the projectile will move to a safe area where it can be extracted, but it is not certain that this will happen. In October 2020, some vandals went to the McNeil Middle School and removed the horse statue from the site. After an extensive search, the statue was found shattered in a barn in the neighboring county. An anonymous tip led police to two local residents, Zachary Kaiser and his friend Tyler Darland. Both were charged and arrested for theft and destruction of property. Shortly afterwards, police arrested Dakota James and Braden Seward, accused of also having participated in the crime of vandalism. Zachary Kaiser and Tyler Darland, the first two vandals to be arrested, were ordered to pay a $400 fine in restitution. They were also sentenced to two years in prison. However, Lauren's parents asked the sentencing judge 
to have the sentence suspended as they believed Zachary and Tyler would find redemption outside of prison. About four months later, Zachary Kaiser was arrested again for another crime he committed. This time he was put in prison where he will spend a few years. A replacement statue was commissioned thanks to the help of friends, neighbors, and family of the victims. And on May 27, 2021, a new memorial was installed in front of the school where Lauren attended. Lauren's funeral and burial took place in September 2016 in Wichita Falls. The farewell ceremony was attended by hundreds of people, including the victim's family, friends, and schoolmates. Lauren's case had huge repercussions throughout the state of Texas. In June 2019, the Texas government passed Lauren's Law, which makes a crime against a person under the age of 15 a capital offense. Vernon and Bianca Landavazo fought hard to get this law passed. While this law is not retroactive and therefore cannot be used in their daughter's case to increase Cody Lott's sentence, Lauren's parents believe it will prevent many other teenagers from falling victim to crimes of the same nature as their daughter was, something that will stop other families from suffering like they are suffering. Well guys, that's it. Thank you so much for watching until now, and I'll see you in the next video.